discover solutions to issues that affect your family and professional life with practical information to help you get past life's adversities. Take a proactive approach to power up your life with Rosalie's expert resources. Fighting the superficial signs of aging since ancient time. Today, women nip, tuck, moisturize, and conceal to combat the aging process. A recent consumer survey found nearly three out of four women believe feeling their age is worse than looking their age. Here to discuss the foundation of beauty and the importance of bone health throughout our life is Dale Hayden, actress, model, and founder of Woman One, and Susan Randall, Senior Director of Science and Education at the National Osteoporosis Foundation. Good morning, ladies. Good morning, Good morning. Liz. Susan, tell us about the Beauty is Bone Deep campaign. The Beauty is Bone Deep campaign is a national campaign that focuses on inner strength as the foundation for beauty as we age. And uh, this is a very important factor because if our skeleton is not strong, then we can't really stand up straight, we can't, um, our clothes don't fit as well, and it, it reflects on the outside of the body as well. Dale, as a beauty icon, share your top tips to fighting the aging process. You know, generally speaking, I'm all, all about sunblock, moisturizer, getting enough exercise, eating healthy, living in balance, nurturing your, yourself from the inside out, and, and also getting information on how to be healthy. You know, as you get, as you move down the timeline in aging, you know, there's different aspects that you get exposed to, and bone health is one of those aspects that you want to hit as early as possible because it doesn't matter, you know, what color lipstick you wear. If your bones aren't strong, um, it's, it doesn't make a difference. And it's fascinating, Rose, to, to hear that a recent survey, 75% of the women out there think they're getting enough calcium in their diet, and uh, actually the truth of it is 9 out of 10 women are not. As we age, do we need more calcium in our diet to keep our bone health in check? The National Osteoporosis Foundation recommends uh, between 1,000 and 1,200 milligrams of calcium uh, for women uh, per day. And uh, what we, uh, remarkably, the American diet on average only has between 600 and 700 milligrams of calcium. And you can see that if 9 out of 10 women uh, aren't getting enough calcium and 75% of women think they are, there's a deficit there. So what we advise is for women to estimate the amount of calcium in their diet and then if necessary supplement up to that up to the recommended amount for them. So women do need to have that conversation with their doctor uh, or their healthcare professional about what the right amount is for them and uh, get some recommendations about how to meet those needs. Also, when we visit our doctor, we can request a test to identify any bone deficiencies or osteoporosis. The simplest test is an annual height measurement to see if a woman is losing height. Um, as we get older, um, one of the first bones possibly that can be affected by osteoporosis are the bones in the spine. And so if, if a woman is losing height over time, and as little as two inches, it's not normal to lose uh, significant amounts of height uh, as we get older. A little bit is okay, uh, more than two inches is not. So an annual height measurement, and then if it's significant, uh, your, your doctor can order a bone density test, which is one of the few medical tests um, that a woman can have that doesn't require you to take off your clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I had the, the bone scan, uh, and I was surprised, Rose, to find out that I had some disintegration in my wrist and my hip. So what it did for me, it just hit alarm bell, and I immediately spoke with my doctor, and uh, I took a regular um, calcium supplement, uh, Citrical. I like the gummies, so I took the Citrical gummies, which are really convenient for me, and they're delicious. And I just take two a day, and then I feel reassured that I'm doing, as well as my weight-bearing exercise, that I'm doing what I need to do to keep my bones strong. Because I have grandchildren. I have four grandchildren. I gotta lift them, I gotta run with them, I gotta climb trees, I gotta do all those things. So I want to ensure that I'm able to do that. And th that's why bone health is extremely important to me. 
Where can our viewers find more information about Beauty is Bone Deep? Good, they can log on to beautyisbonedeep.com. Thanks, Dale and Susan, for joining us this morning and creating awareness of the importance of bone health throughout our life. Exactly. Thank you, Rose. Right. Thank you. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day, and it can sometimes be left out due to our busy routine. Research shows that eating breakfast improves math grades, vocabulary skills, and memory. And children who eat breakfast at school, closer to class and test-taking time, perform better on standardized tests than those who skip breakfast or eat breakfast earlier at home. Actress and mother of four, Holly Robinson-Pete joins us to discuss the challenges of getting our own kids out and ready for their day with a balanced breakfast in the morning. Good morning, Holly. Good morning. Holly, you live a busy life on a very tight schedule. Tell us how you jumpstart your kids each morning with a nutritious breakfast. Oh, listen, I, I, listen, I go for, you know, hard-boiled eggs. I love fruit. Um, I love whole grain toast. And I don't know about everybody else's kids, but I have four, and a couple of them will just refuse to eat. I'm not hungry, Mom. I don't feel like eating, Mom. I'll eat something later. I'll grab something at school. And I can't always be sure that they're going to do that. So I feel like I have the power during breakfast, as you mentioned, most important meal of the day, the truest cliche, to help load them up before they leave and get them ready for the day. Summer berries are nutritious and taste great. But how do we get our older kids to make a fruit choice each morning independently? You know, the way I do it is I try to make smoothies, I try to do preparation with food, I try to make, you know, put it on their pancakes or put it on a whole grain, you know, piece of toast. So you just got to be a little bit more, in, you know, inventive about how you do it. But th those berries are delicious, so I don't know, I can't figure out why kids don't want to eat fruit because it's just so <laughs> great, it tastes so great, especially seasonal, seasonal fruit. Um, but the most important thing is if they see you doing it, they'll do it. They do as you do, not as you say, as we all know. And so the more you can incorporate uh, nutritious meals for yourself in the morning, you know, if you're just going to throw a little piece of co a little like a piece of Danish and some coffee, the kids are going to see that. So you can't tell them to eat nutrition nutritiously if you're not. And so I think it's just really important to just be that example. Um, but I can't wait for those berries to come into season. Holly, we have fresh seasonal Florida strawberries right now. Mmm, you got to send me some. We make smoothies each morning, and it's a great way to get the nutritious value to start our day. I call it a wake-up drink. What do you think? I love that idea, and you know, I love me some Carnation Breakfast Essentials, and there are so many. If you go to the website, carnationbreakfastessentials.com, there's so many delicious smoothies and ways that you can do that, and you can get your protein that way. However you get it, whatever you have your kids eat in the morning, they got to get their protein. And so, it, whether, it's you, you, whether you do a CBE drink, or whether you do a hard-boiled egg, or whatever the protein you can get your kids to take, that's what they need in the morning to, to fuel their day. Thanks, Holly, for joining us this morning and offering tips to overcome the challenges of feeding our family a balanced breakfast to fuel their day. Thank you for having me. One third of the U.S. adult population is affected by obesity. An additional one third of adults are overweight. Some who struggle to control their weight find an everyday decision like what to wear today daunting as they stare into the closet filled with clothes that no longer fit. So where do you find the courage and motivation to begin your weight loss journey? Joining us this morning to discuss the many factors to lose weight are two experts, Julie Morgenstern, renowned organizational expert, and Dr. Stephen Lamb, Director of Men's Health for NYU Langone Medical Center. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Thanks for having us. So what holds people back from starting a weight loss program who frequently say, I'm going to start the diet next week? Well, I think there's a lot of things. As a professional organizer, I can say that I work with people in their spaces to take control of their spaces. And so many people, their closet, the clutter in their closet, as Rosalie, you said, 
a closet filled with clothes that don't fit doesn't actually encourage us, even though we think we're keeping those smaller sizes as motivation, it's not motivation. It ends up feeling like criticism. Every time you open your closet, it's like, oh my gosh, that still doesn't fit. I've spent a fortune on these clothes. And when we start out feeling bad in our day, what do we do? We kind of self-sabotage the rest of the day. So I am encouraging everybody as a part of this My Healthy program, as the first concrete step to shifting your mindset and resetting your buttons is to liberate your closet. And that means remove everything that doesn't currently fit. And you can store smaller sizes away by size so that as you get closer to those goals, you can then go and get them, shop your own closet. But at the end of this liberation process, your closet, just imagine every day you open the closet doors and 100% of what is in there, even if there's just a little bit, 100% fits you and looks good and that it motivates you to take care of yourself in other ways that Dr. Lamb can talk about. So Dr. Lamb, tell us about the My Healthy program. Well, sure. You know, as a physician, it's really great working with Azi on this national movement, uh, My Healthy, which is intended to shift the way we think about obesity and significant uh, you know, weight issues from just the amount of pounds that you lose to health that you gain. And it's very clear that if you are obese, or if you are overweight and you have you know, blood sugar issues or, or, or cholesterol issues or blood pressure issues, that even three to five percent of weight loss, let's say 10 pounds if you weigh 200 pounds, may have a positive impact on those parameters. Of course, if you lose more than five percent, it's even better for most of you. However, there are so many barriers to weight loss, and, and I think that patients are frustrated because you know they lose some weight, they gain some weight, I think that the, the real issue is that, that the medical community is starting to appreciate the complexity of obesity. It's not a character flaw. It's not because you're not motivated. There's a powerful biology that's involved. We're starting to learn more and more about it. So the My Healthy program, in a sense, is if you go to MyHealthy.com, they're simply going to say to you, make a promise that you're going to make a, an appointment with your doctor. Discuss eating and weight loss and exercise and determine what your BMI is, what your blood sugar is. Know those numbers and then come up with a creative but personalized program that is best for you and your lifestyle. And appreciate that small changes, if you are obese or if you're significantly overweight and you have all of these other parameters like blood sugar issues, you know something? It's worth starting slow. Three to five percent, that can be very, very significant. And that's really what this is all about. Appreciate that obesity is a disease. Get all of the motivating, all of the tricks. I agree. I mean, you know, if you have all of this clothing in your, in your closet that doesn't fit, you think you're actually going to fit the next day? You're not going to fit the next. It takes time to lose weight. It's a difficult process. Your body is often resisting your ability to lose weight. And that's why you really need to talk to your doctor about it. What are some small positive changes in our lifestyle that can benefit our lives? Well, I think one of the things we want you to do is go to myhealthy.com and share the actions that you're taking. Don't do this in private. This is a movement. So upload your before and after pictures of your closet. Take pictures of the stuff that you're giving away. Write down the My Healthy commitment that you're making on a placard and take a selfie and upload it because your positive changes will motivate somebody else's. Join the movement. And that act alone of joining others is another great motivator to keep you going as you are on this new healthy path. Thank you, Julie and Dr. Lamb, for joining us this morning to encourage our viewers to get proactive and get healthy. According to the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, allergic disease is the fifth leading chronic disease in the U.S. among all ages, and the third common chronic disease among children under 18 years old. In fact, almost 8% have hay fever, another name for seasonal allergies from pollen, grass, blooming plants, mold, or allergens from pets, foods, medication, and other elements of our environment. Nurse Barb, nurse practitioner and nationally recognized medical expert, joins us with tips to minimize your summer allergy symptoms and discuss the distinction between allergies 
and asthma. Good morning, Nurse Barb. Rosalie, it is a pleasure to be with you because in Florida, there are many areas that are considered allergy capitals. And you know, with all that humidity, there's a lot of mold. So people can be really suffering from allergies and even asthma. What are the biggest allergy triggers inside and outside our home? Well, you bring up a good point because even when blooming plants are releasing a lot of pollen into the air, most people are surprised that indoor air can be five times more polluted than outdoor air, be it pet dander, mold, dust, pollen that gets indoors. And, and this is really important. You know, in the hospital, we have air purifiers. And now people can do that in their own homes. So Fellows has the Aramax 200. This is an air purifier that's a true HEPA filter. And that means that it filters out 99.97% of those allergens, be it mold, germs, pollen, or pet dander. And it filters down to 0.3 microns. So that's smaller than Florida sand. You have to have a microscope to see how small that is. So give us an understanding of the misconceptions of allergies and asthma. Well, some of the biggest misconceptions about allergies and asthma is that they're going to go away. The truth is, is that the more you get exposed, the more symptoms you have. Another big misconception is when you have an allergy, some people like to take a hot shower, but don't do that. Take a cold shower, especially if you're outside and you're exposed to a lot of cut grass or pollen and wash your hair because pollen can get in your hair. So take cold showers, not hot showers. And if you're outside, maybe you're participating in some sports and you get really those allergy symptoms, the watery, itchy eyes, the red skin, put a cold, wet washcloth on your face and in a pinch, reach into your, um, your cooler and get some ice and just put that on your face or your arms or any place where you're exposed to an allergen. Even cleaning our house can stir up some allergens, right? It, it's true. And a lot of people think, you know, when I'm cleaning my house, you know, I'm dusting and I'm vacuuming and I'm sweeping. But sometimes all we're doing is moving dust and pet dander from one place to another. But Hoover has a lock on this, and I really appreciate it. The Hoover Air Steerable has level three allergen block technology. And what that means is that this vacuum traps the pollen, dander, and um, dust particles in the vacuum. So it's not coming out the exhaust. I also like that it has a wand so you can reach into those nooks and crannies where dust and pet dander likes to hide. So what are some treatment options that are easy? Well, as a nurse, I always like to be prepared and I like to keep my medicine cabinet stocked up, but I don't want to break the bank either. So Rexall has allergy relief and it's part of their health and wellness products that are only available exclusively at Dollar General stores. But remember that cold water really works when you are suffering with allergy symptoms. So where can our viewers find more information to help us combat the allergens in and out of our home to enjoy our summer? Well you can go to nursebarb.com for more information on allergies, asthma, and allergens and how to prevent it because I'm all about prevention. Rosalie, it has been a pleasure talking with you. And thank you Nurse Barb for all your tips to keep us cool down and allergy free this summer. Take care, be well. According to a Physical Activity Council report, Florida ranks number seven in inactivity, with 27.5% of the population not participating in physical activities. And people participating in no high calorie activities tend to be higher in the south and lower in the north. Research also shows almost 80% of parents don't consider swimming when planning to put their child in a specific sport. They perceive swimming to be less fun and not as cool as other sports. Not for five-time Olympian Dara Torres. She knows firsthand how competitive swimming changed her life and how swim clubs build physical and personal strength and is a limitless great place to meet friends, enjoy fitness and fun. And we're proud to have her joining us this morning. Hi, Rosalie. Dara, you have won so many competitive medals. How many were there? I have four gold, four silver, and four bronze. 
And the last time you competed in the Olympics, you had a baby. Yes, my daughter was just turned two when I went to the 08 Olympics in Beijing. And, uh, you know, it, she's a big swim fan. So uh, it was nice to have her, you know, in my life while I was going for another Olympic Games. Florida is a perfect swimming environment. So why aren't more children enjoying swimming as a competitive sport? You know, it's like you just said that almost 80% of parents don't think of swimming, even though they've had their kids in swim lessons, as a youth sport. And I don't think they realize that it's fun, it builds confidence, it's safe, it's very easy on kids' bodies. And for me personally, I have my eight-year-old daughter in swimming, not just because I swam, but because I know how much fun it is. And the thing that I love to see is that you always are involved. Unlike other sports where a lot of kids are on the sidelines because they may not be as good as the other kids, you always get to participate in swimming. And that, that was huge when I was trying to figure out a sport for my daughter. So how does swimming help teach our children time management and organizational skills? You know, it's a very structured uh, sport, swimming is, and you know when you're going to swim, you know how long you're going to swim, you know what it takes, uh, you learn about hard work, you learn about sacrifice, you learn about dedication, and like you said, you know, time management, there's so many things that you can learn in the sport of swimming that trickle out into other aspects of your life that as a kid you don't realize, but as an adult, for me swimming that, that far into my life um, and into my middle age, I realize looking back that I learned all those things from the sport of swimming, and that's just huge, and, and that's why I wanted to be a spokesperson for swim today and and you know parents who are wondering gosh you know where do I sign my kids up I moved to Massachusetts recently I didn't even know where to sign my child up I was looking in the yellow pages but luckily enough now swimtoday.org has a website that um, you can put your zip code in and find a local club near you and I think uh, parents need to get a better impression of swimming and if they go to a team and just even watch they see how much camaraderie there is and how much fun kids have swimming Dara, thank you so much for joining us this morning to share the benefits of swimming and how to find a swim club in your neighborhood. My pleasure. And again, just last thing is swim, swimtoday.org is the website. In Florida, 25% of adults 65 and older have been told by a health care provider that they had a heart attack, have coronary heart disease, or had a stroke. And nearly twice as many women in the U.S. die of heart disease, stroke, or other cardiovascular diseases than they do from all forms of cancer. The National Coalition for Women with Heart Disease encourages women to never leave home without one important item in their handbag that can save their life. Joining us this morning to help women learn how to protect their hearts is cardiologist Dr. Tracy Stevens. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. How are you, Rosalie? What warning signs can help women recognize they're having a heart attack? The warning signs for women in having heart attack are imperative to know, and it's humbling in that it may not be real obvious. I generally say any new symptom from the waist on up, as well as new overwhelming fatigue that we can't identify for other reasons why we're having it, we need to think, is this our heart? We might have the chest pain, the elephant on our chest, but women, we need to recognize other symptoms, shortness of breath, indigestion, pain between our shoulder blades. Just simply neck, jaw, or even a toothache may reflect symptoms or signs that we're having a heart attack. Do women experience different symptoms than men when they have a sudden heart attack? And again, it can be the chest pain, but you know, one symptom, Rosalie, I really cringe about is that new overwhelming fatigue, very distinctly different in women. We've all heard that story, a loved one around the holidays, I'm so tired, I'm going to go lie down. And then the family finds that woman has had sudden death in their bedroom on the couch because of a, a symptom they did not recognize. That is one that always gets my utmost attention is new overwhelming fatigue that has slowed us down. And other symptoms, even just a simple elbow discomfort with exertion, that may be more indicative of heart disease in women. And again, not discarding the symptoms in our jaw, our tooth, more of the dentists now are on board. If it's not your tooth, dentists are referring women to cardiologists, their primary care physicians to see, could this be their heart? What steps should we take if we feel the symptoms of a heart attack? What advice would you give your patients? 
the number one thing is to not ignore your symptoms. And that's such the, the importance behind this whole campaign is raise awareness that this is our number one health threat, as you said, uh, heart attack in women. And to recognize these symptoms, not hesitate to call 911. You know, in, in the setting of a heart attack, as women, we show up to the emergency department four hours later than men. And time is muscle. And the likelihood of making it to the emergency department with more time behind us, our, our likelihood of survival is less. So recognize these symptoms. Don't hesitate to call 911. And the number one thing we can do to initiate this process to help, get, help us survive our heart attack, reduce damage, is to carry aspirin in our purse. And I'm an advocate for this handbags and hearts campaign because it recognizes that link to women in their handbags. We have everything else in our handbag. Let's put aspirin in there. Take aspirin at the onset of symptoms of a heart attack because this will reduce muscle damage and save our lives. Dr. Stevens, how does an aspirin control a heart attack? The key in a heart attack is there's a clot form that in the coronary artery that has blocked the blood flow. This can be related to plaque rupture inside that artery. The way aspirin helps protect us, which is a basic staple to address a heart attack, is it inhibits some of the clotting factors, platelets that tend to clump around plaque, that that creates the clot formation and blocks the blood flow. Aspirin is key in that if it's chewed, crushed, taken immediately, it reduces that, that process, reduces more of that clot formation, and helps improve the likelihood of survival. And so we want women to keep aspirin in their handbags and to take at least two of the low-dose aspirin at the onset of symptoms. Not to hesitate calling 911, take that aspirin as directed by their healthcare professional. If they have a regular strength of 325, bite it in half, chew it, crush it, just get it in the system. Thank you, Dr. Stevens, for offering tips to prevent and recognize a heart attack and what to do when the symptoms hit. Thank you for uh, having us on, Rosalie, and I encourage viewers to look at the website, handbagsandhearts.com. The summertime is filled with fun things to do for the entire family. But first and most importantly, protect your family from the summer sun and summer allergens. And kickstart each and every day with a nutritious breakfast. Get organized and get in shape. Start by finding a squib club in your area for you and your kids to enjoy and socialize with other families. Share with us your family plans to get healthy and active at facebook.com forward slash Rosalie Show or visit us at rosalieartershow.com and drop us a line. Enjoy an active life each and every day and we'll see you soon.